Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast all about board and card games and the people who play them. This episode, number 13, is part of our classic series and was originally aired on August 24th, 2005. This episode of the Dice Tower is sponsored by Your Move Games, makers of Battleground Fantasy Warfare, the miniature war game without miniatures. To learn more about Your Move Games or to take a flash demo of Battleground, please visit www.yourmovegames.com. And now, here's your host, Tom Vassell. Hello, this is Tom Vassell welcoming you to episode 13 of the Dice Tower. In episode 13, we started hitting our stride to some degree. At this point, we realized that we couldn't just do questions and answers and and then a top 10. Even though, from this point onwards, our top 10 started getting longer and longer and bigger. And that lasted for quite a long time with a a huge top 10 because it almost became 20 little reviews of games. But we also realized that we had to have something else, so I was constantly delving and looking for different ideas. And in this episode, we introduced a couple segments, but the one that I thought was really interesting was uh, the segment where we talked about player categories, what kind of players that we play with. And this went on for a while and was actually quite popular, to the point where I'm not even sure why we cut it from the show. I think possibly it happened mostly maybe because we were running out of player types. Although maybe we could repeat them or do variations upon them because you meet so many different styles of players. But it was an interesting thing. It was fun, and I I, I like doing it a lot. Uh, So with that being said, I'll let you get into episode 13, and I have some more comments then at the end of the show. Well, welcome to the Dice Tower. This is Tom Vassell. I'm Joe Stedman here, the good-looking one. The good sounding one, though, is me. <laughs> Quit with the Welcome microphone. Welcome to our show. Same the late night radio show. We have music just for you. Hold your close one tight. Actually, what we are is we're a podcast about board games, tabletop games, but mostly board games, uh, war games, Euro games, American games, all different types of games. We talk about them for a little bit over an hour. We argue about them. Mm-hmm. Well, not always. We have good discussions with one another. We, we Yes, there you go. And so, welcome to our show. Today, our top ten list at the end of our show is going to be our top ten games that we think should be reprinted. Yep. And so that should be interesting. It's our 13th episode, which I guess some people think 13 is an unlucky number. So what will happen? (laughs) Well, something will happen. Um, We actually... uh, I'm going to be shopping soon for Christmas, so I might even buy a few Euro games, Tom. I know he will. <laughs> I gotta buy. A it's few not a shock to me. It's more I, of a shock to his listeners. I, I had to buy. A, I gotta buy a few for my wife that were on her top ten list that we don't currently own, or the worse yet, uh, worse yet that I used to own that I traded away. Okay, well, we'll talk more about Joe and his Euro game problem in a bit. <laughs> Hi, my name's Joe, and I hate Euro game. I mean, and I like you know. I don't. Okay, well, either way. Let's get started into our show, and I apologize about that volume problem. We're working on it now as we speak. Um, We uh, Last week, in our episode 12 show, we talked about a contest. We're giving away a game of your choice, either Santiago or Primordial Soup, both of them made by uh, Z-Man Games, Mm -hmm. and you can get either one of those from us if you enter our contest. All you have to do is give us your top ten games from 2004. Actually, Joe wanted you to give him our, your top ten games, uh, your personal top ten games, and then the top ten games that you think are the most popular top ten games. Right, because my top ten games aren't going to win me the contest. No. And that, <laughs> that will never happen in all the years because that the, games are published. Because the, the, the unwashed masses all like a certain type of game, and us elitists, you know, us smart ones, we like other games, and so... Well, either way. <laughs> so... what? So here's what you do. This is how the contest works. For those of you who are hearing about it the first time, you still have one week. You have all the way up to the end of August, basically, before I do the calculations. Yep. Let's say you pick uh, Ticket to Ride as one of your games. If 30 other people put Ticket to Ride in their list, you get 31 points, 30 for them and one for yourself. Mm-hmm. Everyone who puts Ticket to Ride gets 31 points. We add up all those points together, and whoever has the highest score wins. If there's a tie... Then we look at the order that you put the games in to break the tie. Whoever puts the highest rated games 
higher on their list will win the ties. Right. This is a little bit different than last week. Last week I said the order counted more. Now the order only counts for tiebreakers. Yeah, we've been, uh, what, what we give away? We gave um, an Eagle game away last time. Conquest of the Empire? Conquest of the Empire, and we're giving away this, uh, these Euro games this time, and we've already got something lined up for our next giveaway. So We have more than one thing lined up for the future. Yep, yep, we definitely. have some really good stuff coming up, but I really think these two games are excellent. Primordial Soup is uh, a retheming of the game Ur Soup, which is a tremendously good game about growing amoebas. And Santiago, well, today Santiago is my review, so we'll go right into that. Santiago is made by Z-Man Games. It's designed by two different people. It's their first game, and it looks kind of bland when you first look at it. The board isn't that big. Uh, one thing I noticed about it were that the cubes were pink and purple and white and black and, and tan, and they... The game just didn't look that impressive to me. There were some long blue sticks, uh, canals, and I thought, well, building plantations, digging canals, using slaves. Where have we seen this before? It just wasn't that exciting of a, of a, a game theme for me. But when I played the game, I was really impressed. For one thing, it lasts about an hour. And most games that last about an hour aren't that deep. But Santiago actually has a, a fair bit of deepness about it. There's a, a phase in it where each you turn over five tiles, and those five tiles can be from five different plantations, bananas, peppers, beans, etc. And players bid, but when they bid, instead of outbidding the last person, all you have to do is bid a different number than the other person. Whoever bids the lowest becomes the canal overseer, and then the highest bidders on down to the lowest take a tile of their choice, put it on the board with markers of their color on top of that tile. Then players want to put down a canal on the board. There's a spring spot on the board where all the water flows from. Canals leave that spring and spread the water around the board. If your plantation tiles that you put down aren't next to a canal, then they're going to eventually dry up, actually quickly dry up. So you want the canals to flow by your plantations. So players put down markers and show where they want the plantation to be, I mean the canal to be, and they put down a, a, a certain amount of money as a bribe to the canal overseer. The canal overseer, he gets to decide which bribe he's going to take and where he's going to put the canal. He can even put it somewhere else, but then he doesn't get any money, and he has to actually pay money to the bank. So that's pretty fun. Let's say Joe, me, Sam, and Bob are playing the game, and Joe wants to put the canal in one spot, so he puts down $2. Sam wants it in another spot. He puts down $3. Bob likes the spot where Joe has it, so he puts $4 down as it's a Joe's bribe for me. As a canal overseer, I say, well, I really don't like that the canal is going that way, but $6 is good. How can I pass it up? I take the money. They're happy. They get to put the canal down, and Sam is kind of annoyed. And that's was really fun. That phase itself where you're arguing over where the canal goes, sometimes I would try to bribe the canal overseer to put a canal in a spot that was ludicrous that no one even – no one had a plantation there just to annoy the other people playing the game. And as the canal overseer, that means you get the worst plantation tile on the board, but you get to choose where the canal goes, which is a really good opportunity. So that part of the game, that part of the game just makes the whole game for me. Santiago is really fun because of that phase itself. I like the bidding phase. I like the plantation phase. I like the scoring, how the end of the game works. You basically get points for all your markers on the board. Multiply times all your plantation markers uh, that are in the plantation, even if another player has markers on them. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's the kind of scoring that's actually best illustrated by a picture than by me telling you about it. And that's interesting and all, but the arguing over where the canals are uh, to be placed, that to me is the absolute most fun part of the game. And I highly, highly recommend Santiago. If you don't win it in our contest, then you should go out and buy it. It's, it's a sleeper hit. Hasn't seen a, a, a lot of publicity, but I think Santiago is a great game, and you should check it out. So send in your top ten games of 2004, and you have a chance to win. And since we did not say it previously, send them to the Dice Tower at gmail.com, and uh, put Tom or, and or Joe in a title, and we'll get that we'll get that sent to us. You can also check out our website at www.thedicetower.com. Right. All right. Uh, what was the name of that game again? Santiago. Santiago. Is that um, right? Joe has not played it yet. I played it, I think, four or five times now, and somehow Joe just keeps missing the, the game. The title just reminds me of Puerto Rico, so I'm not sure if I'm going to want to play it or not. 
<laughs> well, either way, now we have to listen to a war game review. Yes, yes, a war game review. All right, wake up, wake up. All right, we're into the war game now. Uh, I'm doing a classic today. I'm doing Breakout Normandy. It was published in 1992 by Avalon Hill. Uh, Don Greenwood's the designer with uh, James Stoller. It's a really good game. Um, it's one of my favorite one of my favorite games. It's an area impulse game, a two-player game. Uh, it's basically, it starts at Normandy, uh, and then it works your way through the initial breakout of the Allied troops. It's part of a family of area impulse games. There's Storm Over Arnhem, Thunder at Casino, Turning Point in Stalingrad, and then there's a new one, uh, Monty's Gamble. Basically, this game uh, is just a very, a very tense game. When you play it, it's fun, and it's actually really easy. This is one of the Euro games that, I mean, this is one of the war who, games. Who, I heard him say Euro games. <laughs> this is one of these war games that I think that you could actually convince a Euro gamer to play because it's not overly <laughs> burdened with rules. Um, it does have some, uh, the rule book can be confusing at times, but, you know, it's, 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 once you learn the game, it's easy to teach. Um, now, it's area impulse game, meaning basically that the way the game works is on the allied player turn, he will activate a area, like, and all the units that are in that area get to do what they want to do. And then the Axis player does the same. So it's a very, there's not this big, long, you go, I go uh, problem that a lot of war games have where the one guy can go eat dinner and, you know, go play another game, a Euro game, two or three Euro games, and come back and take his turn. No, actually, it's, it's very fast. You take your turn, I take my turn. You take your turn, I take my turn. And uh, every time I've played it, I always want to do more things on my turn than I'm allowed to. And uh, it's just a really great game. <laughs> Another cool aspect of the game is you, you're, what's going on is that you really don't know how long the days are going to last during the game. It's, it's, a random determ- it's determined randomly, and uh, there's some ways that you can influence how the long the day lasts. And so basically the, the American player is doing everything he can do, or the Allied player is doing everything he can do to make the day as long as possible, and the German player is trying to make that day end quickly. Another aspect of the game is weather. The weather is a big, inf- a big factor. If the, if the German can get lucky and get poor weather, the, the whole game changes. And uh, his freedom of movement is awesome, and he can go on the offensive. And the one thing that's really cool about this game is it's got a great re- it's, it's very replayable. Every time you play it, something different is going to happen. Does that make it a simulation? I don't know. I don't think it's necessarily a simulation. I think it's more just of a war game. Now, all not all time, not all war games are simulations. Uh, I'm sorry. Were you talking? <laughs> yeah, anyway, and uh, it's a fairly a fairly short game for what you get. It's, if you know what you're doing, uh, four hours, maybe three and a half. Uh, if you're learning a game, count on at least five. But uh, it's a good game. I highly recommend it. You pick it up off eBay. I know that uh, I'm pretty sure that Multi Man Publishing. I think they own the rights to it now. I'm not positive on that. Maybe it's someone can email me and let me know. I'm not really sure. But if they do, maybe they'll reprint it. I don't know. But uh, I hope they do. That's, that's a great game, and it's highly sought after. So if you can see a copy, if you find a copy on eBay for cheap, pick it up. I got mine off eBay for uh, $18 because it was a brand-new user from a foreign country, and no one wanted to buy it off of them. And I took a risk, and I bought it, and sure enough, I, sh- I got a shrink wrap copy of Breakout Normandy for $18. So there's my review. Breakout that's Normandy. That's $16 more than I would have paid. That's Breakout Normandy, Tom. Breakout Normandy, and my game was Santiago. Yes, break out Normandy. <laughs> that was a break out your face. With As that. you notice that we've actually uh, started the show, and we didn't start with our questions. Uh, we got right into the content. And we do have some questions, though, and we thought we'd address those right now. Um, just, just a couple this time. Two of them are by Felbrig Harriot. His first question, he says, is what's the most broken or He's, brokenest? He says brokenest. I think it's most broken. But brokenest sounds cooler. Anyway, he said, what's the most broken game by a big publishing house? I had a hard time. I guess, how do you define a broken game? I mean, well, I played a few broken games. One was called Tenjo, <laughs> but that's not by a big publishing house. Maybe Solomon's Temple, but then once you again, Cactus. It, no, Cactus Games is not a big publishing. Big house. publishing houses are usually pretty good at putting out games, play testing, and playing their games. I was just reading a thread today about how someone said that Shadows Over Camelot was broken, and they found some way where you, that basically. The good side draws all the white cards into their hand and only has Merlin cards left in the middle, and they just keep drawing Merlin cards and playing Merlin cards. And while I doubt the validity of that actually occurring in a game, but I don't... But there's a, there's a thing between breaking a game on purpose and a game being broken, right? Right. So There are people who actively try to break games, and I never understood why but, you wanted to do that. I'll, I'll do that if I don't like the game. <laughs> right? 
Well, here's Joe trying to defend himself. Well, but. I mean, there's times when I when I really don't like a game, so I'll just have fun trying to break it. See if there's some weird strategy that the designer might not have thought of that doesn't work. Well, I don't yeah. know if that's breaking the game. I just think that's trying a, a strategy. That, but but I know there's been times when we've played games and I thought the game was silly, so I started doing something that should you should never do, and ended up totally creating a kingmaker situation or uh, a total backwards effect in the game. I don't know. I, I, I can't really think of any off the top of my head, though. I have to think about that. Well, either way, I I couldn't think of one. I, I want to say Crocodile Pool Party. I don't mean to keep smashing that beloved game, but I just can't believe that Rio Grande Games put out such a piece of um, garbage. A broken element to a game, I think, is something that's minor in the game that has a huge influence in the game. Like we were playing that Lightning um, uh, War on Terror. Oh, Remember I know. That? Yeah. Lightning War on Terror. Oh, that's... That's a good example. It's 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 a it's a it's a it's a, it's a trick taking game. It's not a war game or anything, but it, it's it's called Lightning War on Terror. And we were playing it, and there's one card in the game that allows you to. And the, the whole basis of the game is you're trying to build up your hand of cards to make it more and more powerful, so that you can release this onslaught and, and right. win. You, right. You can either play cards now and win the cards that are on the table, or you can save them for later for future and win hands, other cards. Right. That's the strategy but, of the but, game. But then there's this one card, and there's no way to stop this card that allows you to switch hands with an opponent of your choice. And so, so there's no point in the ever point? saving it, cards. And so that that alone just made me think, oh, oh, there's a, and then like even uh, uh, Battle Cry. Battle Cry has that all-out offensive card that people say breaks the game. And so almost mm. almost everyone I know when they play Battle Cry, they eliminate that card right off the bat. They just don't even use it. They take it out of the deck. I think it's too powerful of a card. I don't think it breaks the game though. I don't think I've ever played someone who who won because of that card, but it does certainly give them a huge advantage. I wouldn't advantage. know because I never used the card. I take That's it true. Out. We we preempted that. Sorry, good Felbreg. Good question, though. That is a good question. His other question was, what is your favorite card from any game? He said that his was the Bandits card in Talisman. Uh, I thought about this one for a while. Uh, my favorite card probably comes from Star Wars collectible card game. And it would be a, a three-way tie between Sense, Alter, and Control. I like them because they were the cancel cards. Someone played something on you, you sensed it, or altered it, or controlled it, you canceled it. Those are always good cards to have. Your opponent just played his best thing ever, his this great effect that got him some massive amount of force drain on you, and I would say Sense. Of course, then your opponent could say Alter and cancel your Sense, and then you'd have a, a battle between that, but... The satisfaction of canceling an opponent's cleverly laid plans. Well, that, that kind of leads into my favorite card. and uh, I love it. My favorite card, there's a couple of them, but I like major campaign cards from all the card-driven card games, uh, you know, like Hannibal. But in Hannibal, there's a card that you can play that will prevent your opponent from uh, ever leaving Africa. Or there's a card that, there's a couple There's a couple really powerful cards, and those cards are always fun to, and We the People has a couple. Uh, the Declaration of Independence, when you play that in We the People, it really is a, a game turner, and it's fun to watch the, the British player's face when you play when you play that card. But I don't know. It's, I have a lot of favorite cards. The ones that are evil. I like the cards that are evil. Cards that are evil. <laughs> that sounds like a name for a, another show. <laughs> cards that are evil. <laughs> All right, don't get too scared now, people. We're still friendly. We're still rated G. All right, <laughs> Mike, also known as Physics on Board Game Geek, he emailed us. Uh, he emailed me and said, "Why didn't you stand up to Joe when he?" said that Age of Steam has no theme. And I read over his thing, and I agreed. I can't think of another way to re-theme Age of Steam. How can you say it's a pasted-up theme <laughs> when what else would work? I mean, a train delivering different kinds of goods, but that doesn't mean it's no, a pasted-up okay, okay. theme. Let me, let, me, let me tell you the whole story here, okay? First of all, Tom thinks he's slick, and so normally in the sequencing of our, the way we put our show together normally is that the, the, the questions get emailed to both of us, and Tom usually compiles the questions. He didn't tell me about this question until about two minutes ago. But I did tell him two minutes ago, which is two minutes but, more and, than and I, you know what? I and thought in, about doing it. And in two minutes, I thought of a re-theme. You ready? New York City, right? Each player represents a different gang, okay? And you, the different... Building tracks, instead of building tracks, you're taking over neighborhoods. And as you take over neighborhoods, you can move your goods, your goods, and I'm not going to say uh, what kind of goods, but you're, you're a gang in New York. You're moving your goods to different neighborhoods, different areas, right? And as you move your goods through other people's neighborhoods, you have to pay them a profit. All right, there you go. It's gangs in New York City. And, and, and how do the extra links on your train engine work? And where are you getting shares from? That's easy. Shares is robbing liquor stores. All right. Okay. And the extra links on your train is, means that you have a souped-up hot rod. 
your hot rod can haul more goods, uh, goods as in being narcotics, in case you want to know. And there you have it, folks. Joe stretching <laughs> to try and no, put another serious. theme on it. Uh, Age of Steam is one of my, but you, Tom, you know but, it. But, Age but of Steam you, is one of my favorite Euro games, and so, but you. It's not a paste it on theme. That theme fits that game like a glove. Like a glove. What is theme? What is theme? Theme is nothing but a, a, a device that is used to help you remember how to play, right? I agree. And so in that particular case, it fits well. But I'm not saying that you couldn't take those same mechanics and apply them to a different theme and still work. I still think you could take a game like Hannibal Rome vs. Cart that should make it a amoebas vs. bacteria. Oh, I don't, I don't disagree. I don't think Hannibal, Hannibal is a simulation at oh, all. Oh, wait. You said, the word, you said the simulation word. Now we have to... <laughs> There's steer war- away from that not, conversation. Once again, not all war games are simulations. All right, but here is something about war games. A question from Ken Lee for Joe. He's, he wants to know: Do you like historical games that are not necessarily about combat? So do I. Do I like his, history games that don't have no conflict? All right. right well, and, then, and then my my follow-up question would be: Why is combat so uh, so enjoyable? For you. No, I, I don't mean that. Okay, well, let, let, me, let me answer the first part. Uh, yeah, I do, I'd like a lot of history games, and uh, I was just thinking of these just now, and I wrote down a couple at the top of my head was History of the World, which isn't necessarily a combat game, Kingmaker, Liberté, uh, Civilization, Advanced Civilization, Kremlin, another great game that has to do with history, especially if you use the uh, expansion, which uses the real historical people. These aren't necessarily combat games. No, they're not, but most of the history games that you do play are combat games. What is the what is the dra- drawing in of combat? What is the seductiveness of combat? Because as if you were if you were to go to Consim and you look at my uh, if you go to Consim World and you look at my little tagline that's next to my my name, you'll understand. And I'm not even going to tell you. You have to look it up yourself. <laughs> that doesn't explain it to people who who. who all right. Well, that's what is the seductiveness of war? I mean, I, I know you were a soldier, but well, there's, there's a lot of people who weren't soldiers. It's nothing, to do, like being, it's nothing to do with being a soldier. It's why why do little why do why do I like to watch war movies? Why do I why does history fascinate me? Why does because war is the epitome or the the top of how of I'm trying to explain it. I, I wrote it down. I have a much better way to look at uh, to explain it the way I have it for my avatar over in Constant World. But compared to everything else, basically. War is the top of the food chain, and that's that's you know that is where people live and die. And this is, the, and I like to study war. I mean, this is the, the things that have changed history is war. You know, people can argue that it's been economics and these other things. Uh, these different historians will say it's economics that drive history and everything else. Well, conflict is a major part of that, and you know that's the ultimate expression of patriotism and everything else. Is these guys who go to serve their countries, and it's just a neat thing to study. Hmm. And so, if I'm going to study it and I enjoy studying it, that's just going to bleed into playing games about it, right? So why? What's the big right. draw for you of pasted on theme Euro games? Pasted on theme. What's the big draw with Puerto Rico? The mechanics. You like studying Puerto Rico? The mechanics. It, it doesn't have any anything. Well, I, I like the themes. So you like puzzles too, then? I do. So would you think that would be a pretty good uh, thing then? Would you say the majority of Euro gamers like puzzles and abstract kind of things like on a newspaper where you can see the and that your majority of war gamers like history? I don't know. I would say the majority of war gamers like history. But I like history. A lot. But you can't understand war games. <laughs> I don't know. I don't understand the attraction of them. I understand. Actually, I even understand the attraction. I just don't have it myself. Well, thank you for the questions. If you have a question yourself to send to us, send it to the dice tower at gmail.com. And make sure you put the person's name in the email who you want to read it. If you want both of us to read it, put both our names in it. Um, so we'll read more questions uh, next show. If anyone sends us any. Uh, last night, it was last night, Joe and I went down to Seoul to meet Mike Haverty and his wife, who are com- who were coming to Korea. They're actually in Korea right now, adopting a baby boy to take back, and they're gamers, and they wanted to meet us. The baby's boy's name is Ryan. We also met, and also at the same time, we met Chad Smith, who was in Korea working on an amusement park ride. He also is a board game player. So we met, we, had, uh, we played Oasis, mm-hmm. Gemblo, and Puerto Rico. Now, can you believe that? You just heard me right. Joe played Puerto Rico. Not only did he play it, I believe he suggested it. And you know why I suggested it. Because Because he secretly loves it. Yeah, right. It's been so long since I played the game, I wanted to play it again just to make sure that I still hated it. (laughs) 
And my and, and I know that you he hate this time. He likes it. And you you can say what you want. We played the game. It was long and boring. And I ended up taking second place. And you know that I wasn't even trying. Come on. You he know was I was trying. I was not. How could you say the game was boring? No. Did you not laugh half the game? I had the social interaction was fun, but the there social you go. Interaction, that's that, the game, folks. Social interaction. That was nothing to do with the game, though. We weren't even talking about the game when we were interacting with each other. Yeah, we were. We were we yelling at each well other. Been, and we might have also been playing cards. You know, I mean, why not play spades or something? It was. I actually, after playing Puerto Rico, I th- currently rate Puerto Rico as a seven. And uh, after the game was over, I thought about sacrilege. ranking it up to a seven point five. But I thought about it, and as much, it was, it was a very fun game. I, I do enjoy it. But I think what the player does, who is on your right, affects you so much, and that I think I don't always enjoy that. He, if the player next to you continually picks what you want, and by the time you get to pick first, the thing you want to pick, you can't pick anymore because you've been screwed over by the person to your right. I don't know. Maybe I'm just sour grapes because I, I I came in last place but I did have a lot of fun I did have a lot of fun but Chad I can't believe you kept taking what I wanted I don't know <sighs> but um, compared to war all forms of human endeavor shrink into insignificance I don't know <laughs> we also played Oasis which is an Alan Moon game and I think it's one of his best games uh, I think it's not w- very well known about it, it's very very abstract game but you put cards forward, and you're trying to get other people to pick your cards. And that's just a really fun feature of, of that game for me. And then we played Gemblo, which I mentioned in my blog, and we've been getting lots of... Yeah, a lot of feedback. A lot of feedback. People want to play Gemblo. It's like a six-player blocus. And I really like... I, I bought the game. I mean, and I, I was... I'm, I love it. I played it seven times in less than a week. <laughs> it's going to make your dime list. I know. I never do that with a game, but it's just... It's so fast. It's, and it's, it's just one of those fun. games that you play and it once and then you immediately want to play it again because oh oh I should have done this or I should have done that. And I'm good at it. <laughs> you are. You I, are. You're I not like too, it. You're not too bad. I just I swore that I'll never sit to your left again. Ooh, see what I said about Puerto Rico. Joe says about Jemblo. It's true because <laughs> you should space you should space out the good players. But I wasn't even <laughs> I wasn't even trying to to stop Joe. It just worked out that way every turn. Oh, it was annoying. Oh, I did actually physically punch you, didn't I? He did. I couldn't tell if he was really mad or not. How's your arm? Well, that's obvious. I now, as far it. as getting a copy of Jemblo for yourself, um, they uh, I posted it on my blog, which I do have a blog. It's it's blog.jmstedman.com. Or you can go to thedicetower.com and, and there's a link, link to, to it. Right, thedicetower.com, good. And on there, I have the link to the manufacturer's website. Now, it's it's he has an English website. It's, it's poor English, but it's in English. And he has a link to get the game. Now, you can email him, and he can probably hook you up. And if, if that don't work, worst case scenario, I'm sure that Tom and I could figure something out. But the game's big, and it's, it's, it's a big game. It's the size of a large pizza box. The, the American size large, you know, the big huge pizza box, and so I can't imagine. I can imagine it must be expensive to ship it. So probably I'm, not only is it, it, it's a it's, it's a forty dollar game, right? It's a hexagonal shaped box, which is kind of a, a pain to to pack. Now don't get me wrong. It's worth. I think it's worth the money. The, the actual game. It's a forty dollar game. I think it's definitely worth forty dollars. But the shipping is going to be another twenty dollars at least. Well, that's slow shipping even. That's probably. the slow shipping. Yeah, at least twenty. So I think maybe some of our uh, our game companies need to get on the ball here. Maybe they can get a license for it or something. That's true. But I actually I have, think it'll sell. I really actually do. I have had one game company owner contact me about it. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Stay on your toes. You never know. If you if you got to have one, you're going to die without it. Contact me and I'll I'll send you a copy and I'll, you can we'll work out the details. We also went to a board game convention. We couldn't go to Gen Con because it costs a thousand dollars to fly to America. Unless you want to sponsor us, <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll talk about you every show. You know how we thank Game Fest? We'll say we thank Game Fest for hosting our show and we thank Joe Blow for paying for Tom and I to go to Essen, the Essen or wherever. You know. <laughs> thank you, thank you in advance. I'm looking for who... a sponsor right now. I'll put your name on my forehead. When I go to Origins next year, if you sponsor me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, we also, but anyway, this it was a it was small convention. It wasn't anything big at all. It was run run by one company, Paper Ayagi, and they make Gemblo, or but at it, least they distribute Gemblo. Yeah. But it was really fun. It was really yeah. I had a good time. It was it was neat because um, the, the Korean the Korean culture is much different than the American culture for a game convention. This game convention was full of 
young ladies coming around trying to teach everyone how to play, and it was it was rather funny because we had a, a single guy with us, and I think his mind was more on the young ladies than on the game most of the time. Yeah, but, probably. Right? If Garrett, if you listen to the show, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and that's that's where we first got Jemblo, and we played. The convention was free to go to. Yeah. Uh, we 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 even left with a couple free games. Yeah. They gave you a little ticket that you had to go around and fill out by yeah, playing you had to games. Go to, you had to go to like five different booths, and if you went to five booths and played the demo, then you could get a free game. But you got to roll dice. <laughs> Yeah, you, yeah. And if you rolled dice, if you rolled the right number, I think it was like you snake like eyes. Twelve. Yeah, snake eyes or a d- double six. Then you. Uh, yeah, then you got the game. And if you rolled a four, five, oh, a, a three, four, or a ten or eleven, you got some other good prize. And anything else, you got a die, like a single those, dice, a piece of pla- those big, huge plastic dice. And that's what we got. <laughs> <laughs> well, but we still had a great time. Yeah, but and and the, and the, and the, we were the only Americans there. Yeah. Uh, so we everyone. Was, Joe, me, and Garrett, and then Chad came later. And so I imagine on Korean blogs all over Korea, there's pictures of us playing games because there's probably like 50 different individuals that. That stopped by and took pictures. Stopped, took a, just took a picture of us randomly. Like, we're celebrities. <laughs> and I was happy they had an auction, and I got Chinatown. Oh Woo-hoo! yeah, I had to leave before the auction, but man. I don't. Th- there wasn't any war games anywhere. Was no, it? there was the the Korean one. What's it called? Co- the the Forgotten War Korea. Yeah, I've already I already owned that, so it was all right. But we had a good. It was a good week for games. Extremely good. Week. I also played. Uh, I picked. I also played uh, two other games that Tom didn't play. I played. Uh, obviously, I played more Advanced Squad Leader. Uh, I've been playing that a lot lately. And then I played. Uh, did you talk about the Nexus Nexus game? Whatever it was called. Nexi Nexi. No Nexus. How do you was it Nexus? Is that you say it? Uh, yeah, Nexus is a game that's basically a ladder climbing. Like card g- game. It's like Gang of Four. Or Teach You. And it's better it, but than it teach uses you. big fat that, It's better than Teach You. <laughs> I don't really like ladder climbing games. I like this game, so it must be better than Teach You. I haven't played Teach You, but I'm pretty sure that if I played it, I wouldn't. You not know how I am. If there's a lot of hype about a game, I don't like it. <laughs> I don't know. And then uh, I also played uh, that very. You know, I, I was raving about those Hip Pocket games. I had a good time with Agora, and I had a good game with uh, Lightspeed. And uh, I, so I got another one. At this, at the very the, clever pipe game. At the convention, and my wife and I really think it stinks. All right, it's just horrible. I don't know how anyone could even play this. So it's not very clever. It's not very clever. It's a very stupid pipe game, is the name of it. I, you know, I'd rather play Waterworks. Really? <laughs> yeah. But Waterworks is horrid. <laughs> it, well, trust me. Are you sure? Maybe you didn't miss a rule. We played. There's two versions of the game. We played both versions, and we played it once. And Monica, my wife, says, "Let me read the rules because I don't think we did it right." And so she read the rules, and she says, "Sure enough." And I said, "All right, let's try try the second version." We tried the more advanced second version, and it was even stupider than the first version. Huh. And, uh, you know, I hate to be so blunt, but, you know, someone told us in email that they like how we just say how he feels. <laughs> I have to give that a try and see if I yeah, like it. Yeah, you can, you can have it. Because I heard good things about you can, it. I'll trade, it to, I'll trade you it for your Tigers and Rephrates. <laughs> the reason I never got it, though, was because I, every time I looked at it, I thought, Waterworks, and I hate Waterworks. It's nothing like Waterworks. Okay, but well, we'll see. This episode of The Dice Tower is sponsored by Your Move Games. Your Move Games has recently launched the Battle for Hill 218, a fast-paced two-player card game with a retail price of just $10, coming soon to your friendly local game store. You can also download a free computer version of Hill 218 at www.yourmovegames.com and play against your PC. All right, it's time for my rant. Actually, it's not so much of a rant as an observation, or actually... Uh, an essay. In you're, the not sense, gonna, are you not going to say shut up a bunch of times? Well, I'll say shut up. <laughs> uh, it's about sportsmanship. What exactly is sportsmanship when it comes to playing a board game? Being a good sport, being a good winner, being a good loser. But I think it can be summed down to simply this. I think that you are a good sport in a game when you make the game playing experience enjoyable for those you're playing against. So that means if you're at the World Board Gaming Champions... Chips. And oh, you play, here, we go, here we go. No, no, listen. And you play competitively as hard as you can. You're making it fun for those people because that is what they want and that is what they expect. But when you are playing with a group of friends and family who are just there to have fun, that may not be the best way to play. You still play to win, but not as die hard competitively because that is what they want. They want the social experience. If you're playing with people who like to lean back and talk during the game, then I think that's the way you should play. I think you should. Suck it up and play the way the people you're playing against play. Except in the two-player game, I guess it's a 50-50 deal. Mm-hmm. But So you should just be what people want you to be. Not be what people want you to be, but to make the experience enjoyable for them. Yeah, okay. Whether you know, And that I think a lot of it comes down to the fact, especially when you play a game you don't like, 
then you need to not make – you may be having a miserable experience. <laughs> it's not necessarily uh, – You nailed me now. It's not necessarily good for you to make the experience unenjoyable for the people who do enjoy the game. And I wasn't necessarily thinking of anyone in particular. Yeah, right. It takes me off. Shut up. <laughs> no, come on. When you, when you, Tom, you introduce a new game to me like every other day, and some of the games just are stupid, and I don't want to play them. And it's just like, how, how do you expect me to not to hide that? I'm not. I'm not I mean to hide talking that, I mean. about you per se. Um, I'm just saying that. Oh, I don't care about myself in what, particular. What, what was that one time that we were playing? Me, you, and Bob we were playing a game, and it was just both of us couldn't stand it. It was uh, Globopolis. Globopolis. Oh my goodness! Talk about a horrid game. Yeah, but I thought the game was bad too. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when you're in a game. Let's say you're in a party game where it, it, it requires you to get involved in that, and halfway through you don't feel like doing it anymore. You you can you can tend to ruin the game for everybody else. Or when you argue with someone else and have a big fight in the middle of a game, you tend to ruin the game for everyone else. I think good sportsmanship is making the experience enjoyable for everyone else. And that's my rant. That was, a, that was kind of a lukewarm rant, Tom. Can I get another shut up out of you? No, I'm oh, good. All right, man. And that really ticks me off. <laughs> we're, we're trying to say <laughs> clips so that they can take them and put them in our intro. Like, <laughs> board games rule. Euro games stink. Anyway. I don't like war games. Okay, that's good. You can clip <laughs> right, that. That's, that's like that product placement in the movie. You know, the guy holds a Coke can just at the right angle so you can see it during the movie. All right. Joe has something to say. Uh, this week I'm going to talk about a, a soldier. Uh, I haven't done this in a few weeks, um, and I had a few people ask me why I hadn't. It's just uh, I was doing different things. But I want to talk about a soldier named Jesse. Uh, he's a married guy. He's been stationed here for almost a year. He's married to a, a Russian lady, and... Uh, if you're familiar with the military at all, um, a lot of military men are married to Russian ladies, Filipino ladies, Korean ladies, a lot of international marriages in the military. And uh, he's a pretty good guy. And if you go to my website, you can see some pictures of him. Um, lately, he's been kind of uh, out of sight, out of mind. Uh, the rumor is, me and my other gaming buddies, the rumor is his wife has kind of put the clamp down. He can't go out and game with us anymore. But uh, maybe if he, we'll pray for him and get him back out to the games. But most importantly... Um, you know that Tom and I are Christians, and what we do is uh, what we do over here is as missionaries. And what I what, what I do is I try to get these guys in the church, get them get them saved, be Christians. Jesse's definitely not a Christian. Uh, if you're a Christian, please pray for Jesse that he can uh, get saved. And that's that's my soldier of the week. All right, we have uh, different categories in our show, different sections, and this week we're introducing two new sections at a time. Woohoo! I know. <laughs> One was Joe's idea, and the other was Joe's idea. Okay. So, actually, we gotta give credit where credit's due. Actually, some of these, most of these ideas are from uh, listeners. Okay. Well, I don't, I don't know. The first one is player categories. Uh, we're gonna talk briefly, and I know there are geek lists on this subject, and I know there are other things, but we just thought we would quickly mention a gamer characteristic. And maybe you know so, this gamer, or maybe right. you are so this gamer. At, at your next gaming session, you can like if someone is doing one of these two things this week, you can call them this, and then you can like have an inside joke. Right, <laughs> and they'll say, "What are you talking about?" And you're like, like, <laughs> <laughs> people who always, you know, we try not to have as many inside jokes in our show as possible. We want you to understand what we're talking about. Constant World and the Geek. When we talk about those, those are two websites: www.constantworld.com and www.boardgamegeek.com. But right. and now we're going to have our inside well, jokes. On a, on a rabbit show, on consumworld.com, now we have our own thread, the, the Dice Tower does. Ah. So if you were, I got some emails from guys on Consum wanting to know how could they know when we updated and things like this. Uh, we'll be posting updates there for now on. So go ahead and search it out and subscribe to it, and then you can find out. Well, here's my player category for this week. It's the sorter. This is the guy who sits there during the game, and he takes all his houses from settlers and his and his roads and sacks them nice neat roads. When you play a um, Conquest of the Empire, he takes his whole army and stacks it in very neat row. He has his dice stacked right, in front dress. of him. He, whatever the game is, he has every single piece in the game neatly stacked. Isn't and that if, just called compulsive disorder? And if for some reason <laughs> the dice knock it over, it's uh. not a good day for him. And sometimes these people not only stack their stuff, then they start working on the person's stuff next to them and straightening that out. We know Tom and I know a guy that does this, and he's one of our gaming buddies here. Right. I I don't normally do this. I just have a pile of stuff. That's <laughs> all me. my just... all my stuff's in this big jumbled pile. I'm like, oh, I wonder if I still have an infantry unit. Let me look through my stuff. But this guy always is very neat yeah, we, and organized. We, we know a guy. His name is Sam. And sometimes when Sam will leave the bathroom, leave to go to the bathroom or get a drink, I'll reach over and knock over his soldiers, and it really takes him off. 
<laughs> it gets them out of the groove of the game, and I can take advantage of his weakness. So that person is the sorter. The sorter. All right, and uh, who I'm going to talk about, I call the Ahab. All right, now if you're familiar with literature, Moby Dick, there was a character named Ahab. And Ahab, he really wanted to kill Moby Dick. He didn't care what the cost. He basically, what was, uh, Tom, you're the literature man. What was the quote, with my last breath I shall plunge at thee or something? What? I don't know. Anyway. That's a boring book. It's a, I like the book. Have it's you a, read the unabridged version? No, of... I read the Cliff Notes. So okay. <laughs> actually, they have a comic book version of the book I read. <laughs> a comic version of, of the Cliff Notes. <laughs> anyway, so I call this guy the Ahab. And the Ahab is the guy that, this, this really happens during multiplayer war games, uh, which is a whole, a whole can of worms. But in a multiplayer war game, or even in a Euro game, I've seen this many times. Like in, I've seen this in uh, Age of Steam. The, the Ahab is the guy that you do something to him only because you're trying to better your own situation, and it ticks him off. And then after that point, he doesn't care anymore about winning the game. He doesn't care about his strategy or nothing. His goal in life now is to make you lose. And, you, and, uh, and Tom, Tom was laughing when I told him that I was going to do Ahab because Tom knows that this is often me. <laughs> I, I, would, was that me sometimes, Tom? You yes. <laughs> Actually, Joe doesn't normally do this except with me. Yeah, well, you're you're like a person that metagaming is a big deal for me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there, I admitted it. I, I admitted it. it. Finally, I admitted it. Uh-huh. Now, so it, it's it, on the air, folks. See, he has it out for me. So the next time you're playing a game, and this happens, you can call him a stinking Ahab. All right, don't say, <laughs> don't. All right, there you go. Don't let him be an Ahab. Okay. Our next feature of the show, and before we get to it, let me mention that we have some audio clips. Uh, one from Walt O'Hara and Chris Brooks. Uh, has an audio report of Gen Con. Yep. We're going to be playing the first of those next week. We just need to do a little bit more editing to get them yeah, ready. Yeah, we're getting some new. We've uh, thanks as, thanks to a listener, we've got we're hooking up with a new audio recording program where we're we're going through that process right now. So right, so we're 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 going to switch over. I'm hoping our audio quality here is good. I think the beginning of this show was a little loud, but hopefully yeah, right. hopefully we'll be able to fix all our problems in the future. Well, at least all our audio problems. <laughs> our next feature. And I think it's your turn to go first for once. All right, is, all right. Is Game of the Month, or Joe calls it... I call it the Flavor of the Month, but Tom thought that was corny. You know, yeah, like, I, like nothing else in our show is corny, like kangaroos and turkeys. Isn't, and isn't all. there a better name than Flavor of the Month? If you're his email, us and tell us. I'm sure there is. But Basically, it's just a game that over the past month has just been a game that we've this, been really interested once, in. Once again, this wasn't original me. Actually, the, the big tall glass of water... The Mountain Man, as people call him. No, the Man Mountain. The Man Mountain, right, as people call him. Gary Christensen, we owe you thanks for these two segments. These are both his idea, and uh, Gary's a great guy out there in Columbus, Ohio. And uh, Anyway, I heard that he's going to pay my way to Origins next year. Um, oh, yeah, that's right. I saw that. Guraya. I'm teaching you a Korean. Guraya. That means just joking. Okay. Anyway, uh, so my flavor of the month, and this is the game that I just like this month. It may not be my favorite game, anything else, but... Um, and I know I sound like a broken record, but my favorite game this month is Advanced Squad Leader Starter Kit. I've just played it multiple, multiple times, and I've just, wow, I'm actually going to venture out and play it on Vassal. Not Tom Vassal. <laughs> I've always appreciated that the wargaming community has honored me by naming their their most efficient emailing play, way to play war games after me. Yeah, right, because it, 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 I like to think about that. When I'm playing a war game, I'm playing it on Vassal. I picture Tom being smashed to the ground, and i got pieces and shits all over his back, and just moving around. But uh, I'm, in, I'm venturing out into Vassal. Um, do, you, do you sense the animosity, people? I mean, really? Oh, come on, get off it. Should we hug again? No. We, <laughs> we, made, we, made we didn't listeners. hug last show, by the way. <laughs> that was just a joke. <laughs> Goorah, ya. <laughs> Anyway, so yeah, mine advanced is advanced squad leader starter kit, hands down. I I've, I've played it a lot. Of, it made my dime list this month, and that's the start a squad leader. Wow, so that's that's pretty amazing. For me, uh, my game of this month has been Battle Stations, and I've only played it once by myself. <laughs> but I've spent so much time reading the rules, looking at the pieces. Basically, it's a simulation in space, which I, I normally shy away from. But in this one. Your ship lands, you can board the other ship, and you have characters on the ship. It's kind of like a role-playing game mixed with a space combat game uh, uh, at, with a board game. It's hard to ex- explain. It's, it it's by Guerrilla r- Games. I like the rule book. It looked like something I would like. Yeah, and, and actually, last week we prepared to play. Everyone made their characters. We're going to play this Sunday, hopefully, and see how the first mission goes. I'm, I, I play like the, the bad guys, and Joe's going to be the pilot and the captain of his ship. 
with uh, uh, his trusty crewmate. So we should two or three other guys are going to be a different role. Basically, it's like a real dumbed down version of Starfleet battles. Yes, I, I would say that that's accurate. But at the same time, it's combined with a very advanced hero quest. Yeah, so, so it, it's kind of weird. The, without all the cool bits. The rule book is 100 pages long. I have the first expansion, too, which is called Galactic Civil War. There's another expansion already out and three more planned. It, it, I mean, it looks like a, a game looking, you could really get into. I'm looking forward to it because I, I like to role play, and I never get to do it because I, I shy away from role playing a lot. But it, it just looks like there's a role playing aspect to it. It looks looks like it'd be fun. Yeah, we'll, we'll tell you how that went next time. If and we ever get a chance to play it, I don't know. <laughs> One, all right. One time, actually more than once, a few listeners have sent in and said that we don't talk enough about older games. They said we talk about newer games and no, they didn't say we. They said you. Okay, but either way, we do na- naturally tend to talk about games that have come out. They're the games Tom, that are big Tom's and hot. Like- Sounds like the teenagers in my, my high school classes I teach. They don't have any concept of what happened a few days ago. They just think about the Yeah, year but now. my opinion, what's new, the new games blow the old games away. However, there are old games that are great. And the problem with a lot of these games is they're out of print. And the, today is the day of reprinting. Mm. When Joe and I went to make our list, which is the top ten games that need to be reprinted, a lot of the games that I was going to put on my list, are being I don't have to because they're being reprinted. In fact, there may be games on our list... That are being reprinted. We just if, don't know about it. If they are, sorry. Yeah, and that's like, if, if you find out, if we make an email us, we could be like spread the gossip over the air. If you've heard some rumor about a certain game that we're talking about being reprinted, let us know. And we'll tell your rumor to the world. <laughs> All right, so these are our top ten games that are out of print. And in many cases, they're very expensive. And we would like to see them reprinted. All right. So number ten. Number ten. Are we gonna get? I gotta get my sound clip, Tom. It's mandatory. Which 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 sound clip is this? So we don't have any dead air. My favorite one. Uh, I don't know. Just, just click on it. Give me give me scumbag. Okay, scumbag. Anyway, so the like I said, the the. <laughs> well, look at that. We got dead air again. I'm really apologetic about this. So I wasn't if, planning to do this at all. Just let me be in charge of the. Uh, the, the the clips. The clips. I'm What's gonna... your name, scumbag? Wow, Man, that was, was loud. loud. <laughs> all right, we won't do that again. All right, anyway. All right, number 10. Uh, for me, I have a game called Invasion America. Now, this is different than Fortress America, which I'm not going to talk about. Invasion America is the predecessor to that game. It was It's an uh, old Avalon Hill game. Um, no, SPI. I'm sorry. It's a, don't, I'm sorry for the sacrilegious remark. It's an old SPI game. I had never actually heard of this game until a few years ago, and Gary Christensen, a good friend of mine I talked about earlier, he has this game, and he brings it to Origins every year, and he's a fanatic for this game. And I actually know that Gary is actively trying to find someone to republish this game. And Gary might, you know, maybe I'm sharing some secrets here, but, man, I really hope he does because I, I got to play it once, and I've seen it played many times. It's, it's, a, it's basically Fortress America made into a war game. And I'm not saying Fortress America is not a war game. Uh, this is just a lot more advanced. You have the different armies coming at you. You got the huge American map. It's got this really interesting hidden. Uh, uh, your 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 chits are they're, they got question marks on one side, so you really don't know the strength of your of your own units, let alone. And it, it's it's just a very interesting game. I would uh, if you see a copy on eBay for cheap, pick it up, and I hope they reprint it. Okay, I never heard of it either. My number ten game is La Cita. It's a game of building. Your cities, it's a its a huge game. I managed to pick mine up in a trade. I'm glad I managed to pick it up. If I hadn't picked it up in the trade, I probably still wouldn't own it today. But it's a, it's a game where you... It reminds me kind of of Civilization for the, the computer. It was printed in 2000, so it's only five years old. But it's a huge box. Uh, it was done by Rio Grande Games and Cosmos. And basically, you each control different cities, and you're trying to build your cities up and add different features to them to make them more powerful and to get more victory points at the end of the game. It's a beautiful-looking game. It actually has a good bit of strategy in it, very little luck. Um, but sadly, it's out of print. And so someone bring back La Cita. Good. So that's my number 10 game, La Cita. All right. And then just one more thing about my 10 game. Can you imagine a new game with the European Socialist Coalition and the South American Union and the Pan-Asianic League? Ooh, doesn't that just excite you, Tom? I'm about to talk about that. Oh, I'm sorry. 
our number nine game, and I say R because this is a, a, a weird situation. The universe might explode because Woo-hoo! me and Tom have the same game for number nine. That's right. And uh, number nine game for us is Kremlin. Amen. Bring back Kremlin. Bring back the communist <laughs> propaganda from the 1980s. <laughs> Kremlin is a uh, old Avalon Hill game where you... It's more of a Euro game, I guess you would almost say, than a war game. It's not a war game. Um, you 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 spend uh, influence points trying to promote your your person, your person in the what's that fancy word, the portobello? I can't ever pronounce it right. I, I can't either. But in the in the main ruling body of the Kremlin, right? You're trying to promote your character, your fictional character, to the official head of the of the, of the Soviet Union. And if you can do that, and you can get him to wave in a parade two different times, you win. Now, one thing that's really cool is I was able to buy the expansion. They came out with an ex- for an expansion which replaced the fictional characters with real flesh and blood people. So it starts off the game with Joseph Stalin being in charge, and he's really old. And the game the, you can't win with him, so he dies off. And then you got all the minor characters who are real people. You know, and it's just it's, it's, it's a fun game, and I would love to see it reprinted. I I, I agree. Uh, Kremlin is a game. It's a little fiddly in parts. I think it, I think with a reprint. It probably wouldn't be a bad idea to streamline it, streamline it a little bit, but it's, the, the it's cards a lot of fun. The different cards, and there's no real good matrix of how the cards compare to each other. There's, there's right. Some, but, yeah, sure, but that's what happens in reprints. They usually fix mistakes. <laughs> this episode of the Dice Tower is sponsored by Your Move Games, whose most recent Battleground faction, the High Elves, is currently in stores. So what's your number eight, games? Uh, my number eight is another Avalon Hill, uh, Kingmaker. And uh, this is a, this is one of my... It's Joe's motto in life, not just a, a game he likes. <laughs> the Kingmaker. Maybe it'll be one of my uh, opponents next week if I talk about that segment again. But uh, no, Kingmaker is a game that takes... It's a seven years war. Um, you're trying to uh, have your your person in the royal family promoted to the king. Um, great game. I played at uh, Origins on a huge board with a guy uh, made out of wood and you have miniatures. And, but Kingmaker is, a, is just... Wow. It's It's a classic. And it should be reprinted. I think people would buy it. My number eight game I just picked up at auction, Chinatown. It's number two in the Alia series of nine games, which the first, I think the first five are better than the last four. But still, they're all pretty much good games. The last two, I don't know about. But Chinatown is the best of all of them. I like Ra a lot. I like Puerto Rico. I like the Traders of Genoa. But Chinatown is the game of negotiation. There is no game I like as good. Now, I do say that there are people who don't like Chinatown. Uh, we played it this past Sunday, and, and there were several people who did not like it at all. I think but it's just a pure negotiation factor. It some can, people it don't can like be evil. That. You know it can be evil. But it's a good game. I'm not, sure why it's not be rep- I'm, sure, I'm not sure why it's not being reprinted. It's not politically correct. Maybe it's, well, and maybe, there's just, maybe it's because it turns off that many people. It's not that popular. But man, you it's talk game, about it's, negotiation. It's China a gamer's town. game, I think. Reprint it, please. I said seven years war. I meant War of the Roses. A little slip on my tongue there. You're right. It was War of the Roses. All right. What number are we on? I played Kingmaker several times. We're at number seven. Number seven. All right. My number seven is Ambush by Victory Games. Uh, this is a solitaire game. And I know with the, the modern computer age, and actually Tom was just making fun of me not to not too long ago about playing this game. I have it set up in my classroom and my school. Well, no, I was asking a serious question. Why Why he played a solitaire board game when a computer game did the same amount of stuff in my There's opinion. multiple reasons. I mean, uh, there's uh, multiple reasons that you would do this. Just one. <laughs> I, I like... I like to play with the board game. It just, I mean, with the with the board game, it just it just feels more real to me. And I like doing the, the compilations. I think it's just enjoyable to me as a whole role playing aspect. That yeah, I just don't get playing a computer game. And I don't, I, you don't always have access to a role. I mean, to a computer, you can stick this baby in a box and take it with you, and uh, and you can do it at work. And someone walks in and they're not going to say, hey, are you playing a computer game? No, they'll see you playing a board game, and they will have no idea what it is because we know that most people in the world don't have a clue what board games are. <laughs> wow, well, I don't want to get into that. But, uh, anyway, yeah. I think there would be a market if you could retheme, it. not retheme it, but remake this game, remake it, re- reproduce it, maybe streamline it some, combine all the different um, expansions. I think there's three expansions for it. Combine them into one game, market it as a solitaire game. I think it would sell, and I would buy it. All right, my number seven game is Kings and Things. Now, I know that it's been reprinted in Germany, and I'm not sure if it's still in print in Germany or not, but all I, I want an American version because there's so much text in the game that 
I, I would just really like to be able to read it. Um, and it's not a game you can paste up. It's actually a game with chits, which is kind Ooh. of weird for me. Um, Joe's played the game once. I, I don't know if you remember playing it. It has a couple of different monsters from all different types. You pull one out randomly and add them to your army. But it's it's really, to me, it's just fun. You have killer penguins, dwarfs, uh, raging elephants, and all these things in the same army. It's there's a lot of randomness to it. There's some king making, elimination, all the things I don't like about games. Oh, but, it sounds like I would like it. But because of the the funniness of the theme, I really enjoy playing it. Because my copy is in German, I don't play it that often because it's so much of a struggle to continually look things up. So I'm looking for an English reprint, please. This game by Tom Wham. Oh, Kings I, and I, I do remember this game. I, I did like that game. Yeah, but it was too hard to look up the uh, the stuff all the time. Yeah, yeah. It needs to be streamlined. So, my number seven, Kings and Things. Streamlined. That's our buzzword this show. Number six. <laughs> number six, uh, Atlantic Storm. Um, boy, can't you tell I'm an Avalon Hill fan, the old Avalon Hill? You know, Atlantic Storm, we've, we've discussed it multiple times in different shows. I don't need to go into a lot of detail. It's a card game. They also had plans to make a Pacific Storm. I think you could put these two together, package them, and I would pay 30 40 bucks for it, at least. Um, great, great trick-taking game. It just adds a whole, there's a whole uh, negotiation part of the game that a lot of games lack. Sure, it's pasted on. The theme is, but who cares? It's well, apparently you do, but okay. I, I still think <laughs> they should make Pacific Storm. I would like to, I know it probably would be pretty much the same game, but with different cards would be cool. Sure. Let me get away from the copyright problems. Yeah, maybe. Well, they could like, call it Pacific Typhoon. Hurricane. Typhoon. <laughs> Desert Storm. All right. My number six game is Union Pacific. And I think that one probably won't happen because if I remember correctly, the uh, actual company Union Pacific has copyrighted that name <laughs> and won't let the game be produced anymore, at least in America. Hmm. But, man, Union Pacific is such a good game. It's very similar to Acquire. Joe likes it better I because do, it has I trains. Like, I like it better. And there's a bit of a push-your-luck factor. Mm-hmm. How long are you going to wait to put down your shares in the different companies? I really like it. And I, I, I own my copy, but I think it should be reprinted because I think more people should own it. You actually own my copy. Well, it's part of the mega. was your copy. It was part of the mega trade. Yes, trademark. Trademark. 2005. Trademark, the dice tower. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, what number are we on? We're now? at number five. I'm my losing, number I'm, six I'm, was Union Pacific. I'm losing my mind here. All right, number five, uh, another SPI, Jim Dunnigan game, Battle for Germany. This is this is a classic, and I've talked about it many times. You know, <laughs> of course, my, unlike Tom, a lot of my favorite games are games that are out of print, and so of course I'm going to mention them today. Uh, Battle for Germany, one player plays uh, the Western Allies and the Eastern axis and the other player plays the opposite and it just works cool because you're both trying to capture berlin and you're working against each other and trying to stop each other at the same time with the germans and it's just a great elegant game the 24 hour miracle it's a 24 hour miracle game and i could tell the story of that sometime okay great so my number five game <laughs> is capital capital is a game where you build towers using blocks it's another game by alan moon seems like I, I really like him as a designer, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But not Warriors. What a horrible game that is. But anyway, Capital is a game that the, the blocks are chunky. You get to build your towers out of these blocks and put... And, and it's kind of an area control game mixed with a tower building game. It reminds me slightly of Manhattan. People complain about the scoring mechanism, but I just think the whole package is really cool. It's a really neat game. Joe likes it, which is, you know, a rarity for him with Euro games. And... It, it's just, it's a beautiful game. They need to reprint Capital, that my number five game. Joe's number four game says HRVC. <laughs> what does that mean, Joe? H colon RVC. Oh. It's a big R, little V, big C. And this is uh, my number four, uh, definitely Hannibal Rome versus Carthage. There's no way in the world that people should have to pay over $100 for this game on eBay. It's ridiculous. And I don't understand why Avalon Hill or Wizards of the Coast or whoever it is doesn't go, duh, we could actually make some money on this and do a print run on it, and they could sell the copies. I don't know. It's a great game. It's a card-driven game. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's one of the more talked-about games that are warish uh, in the Euro world. <laughs> Hannibal Rome versus Carthage. It's a great game. No more needs to be said. I republish this thing. I don't made. even dislike it. I, I, For me, this is Hannibal Rome versus Carthage. I just can't believe it's not been republished. I'm serious. I mean, what is, there's got to be some kind of background story that we don't know. 
You're right. We the talked rest about, of the story. We talked about one time how you could get ten grand together and buy <coughs> buy the rights to certain games from Avalon Hill. I mean, from uh, Wizards of the Coast. And I wonder if anyone's done that yet. You guys well, when Joe has ten grand, we know what he's going to do with it. I'm not going to buy that game. I'll buy a different game, and that's farther down my list. Oh, I see. Closer to the number one. My number four game is Big City by Benno DeLonge. DeLong. I apologize, Benno, for mispronouncing your name. But his his best game that he's done, or his most famous game, not his best game, is Transamerica. Transamerica is a good game for some people. But my favorite game by far is Big City. Big City has cool plastic pieces. Basically, you're building a city, and... Wow, someone just brought us food. How cool is that? <laughs> That's a first on a dice tower. We had a guy just bring us a plate of fried shrimp. All right, see? So now the show has just gotten better. The show has just gotten longer, too. <laughs> i got I got a quick talk about Big City here. Big City, though, has really neat plastic pieces. I'm really shocked that it was never reprinted or that it was never more popular. It's The plastic pieces aren't necessary for the game, but they sure make it look good. And so my number four game is Big City. Bring it back, please. <laughs> Hold on, I'm chewing. Oh, Big City, the great All right, I'm not going to do that no more. I'll wait. All right, number three. My number three is also a car-driven game, and I like it better than Hannibal Rome vs. Carthage. It's We the People, and uh, We the People is a revolutionary war game. I think it's the best revolutionary war game. It's not a simulation. It's a car-driven game, and I don't think car-driven games are simulations. All right, but I really, really enjoy the game. It's one of my top five games, um, and it's out of print. I got my copy on eBay. Uh, no, I got my copy at an auction, and uh, I've, I've really enjoyed it. I've put my cards in card protectors because I use them so much, and I'm in the market for the expansion cards, and so if you have them and you want to sell them to me, let me know. Better yet, if you want to give them to me, I'll say your name on the air. <laughs> Joe, you can't keep selling selling our airtime. I'm trying to use our fame for some kind of you know money, you know, some kind of fortune. I'm trying to use it for my benefit, but you know, uh, it doesn't seem know. to work. My number three game is kind of like Joe's. Uh, what was it Invasion America? Okay, we just saw Conquest of the Empire reprinted. We've seen Axis and Allies revised. We've seen, well, that's it. But still, come on, Fortress America, the ultimate 1980s game <laughs> about America under siege from three different sides. Wolverines! Come on, it was. It is a fun game. You cannot. Anyone who's ever played the game cannot deny how much fun Fortress America is. People argue and say. The invaders are more powerful. They argue and say America is more powerful. But I noticed that there's people in both camps, so the game must be pretty well balanced. I don't often like war games or light war games, but Fortress America is a lot of fun. If Someone, please reprint it. Come on, Eagle. I know you're listening. Mm-hmm. You want to do it. Truthfully, though, you'd rather see Fortress... I like Fortress America, but I think I'd rather see Shogun redone. Maybe, but I, I don't know. The Fortress Admit. America, I just have a soft spot for it. I love those little swords in Shogun. That's true. All right, where are we at? Number two? Mm-hmm. All right, number two, uh, the game I did my review on today, Breakout Normandy. Now, uh, I did a review on it, so I don't think i talk about it. Now, for, I, I thought I heard someone say that Multiman Publishing was going to republish it, but I, I haven't seen anything. Maybe I'm just missing the boat here. I missed the the, the email that came out. <laughs> Joe misses the boat on a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. So Breakout Normandy needs to be redone. It needs to introduce a whole new generation of pe- people to wargaming it. <laughs> All right. It's a good bridge game. My number two game is Trom Fabric. It's the Rainer Knizia game about bidding on movies. Um, the Most of the movies are old movies from the 1920s and 30s and 40s. And I know that there's copyright problems of getting modern movies. And, and I know there's all kinds of problems of republishing this game. I don't care. The theme is great. Who doesn't like to make their own movies? And the game itself is actually a really good auction game. It's not the best auction game, but because of the movie theme, it's really fun. I know that I can get a cheap copy of this probably if I went to Germany, but anywhere else in the world, they're hard to find, very hard to find. And I would like to see a reprint, especially when it was done in English. Yeah. So. Good. I like that game. It's fun. My number two game is Trom Fabric. All right. Number now for our number one game. Bum, ba, da, bum, 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 bum. Dong. <laughs> My number one game, I actually know people have talked about reprinting it. I know that a certain company has the rights to it, and I'm just waiting. Maybe this is a gentle rib to the, get the going here. Come on. And that's uh, the card driven, the card game up front. It's basically X, or access now. It's not even close. It's basically... <laughs> it's, it's basically... Access it. <laughs> it's basically... Sorry. 
advanced <laughs> squad leader in a card game, and it's really, really fun. The rule book is uh, horrible, but, you know, if you can get someone to teach you how to play, that's the best way to go. Or you can slug your way through the poorly written rule book, and that's just my opinion and about 5,000 other people's opinion. But, man, redo this game. It's it, There's a market for it, and if you redo it, change the stinking box cover to be in something more generic than this close-up of some German in his, in his helmet and the stigma that goes with that is it's scaring people away and take take it from me just do something more generic you know maybe just some flags or some kind of battle scene or something and then redo the game re, re, rewrite the rules there's there's such a fan base for this game there think of the as, the uh, access and now actually why I say access now think of the advanced squad leader guys that would love to get this game if they could just afford it it's a great great game please multi-man republish this game soon I'll pre-order it. I'll do the whatever you want me to do. I want it. All right. My number one game, I think, I'm not sure, but it may have the distinction of being published by more companies than any other game. Um, it's Cosmic Encounter. I, it's my number two game, and it's not being, it's not in print right now. I mean, Eon had it. Um, the Stupid Games Workshop had it for a while. I think another <laughs> company had it. Then Mayfair had it. And then Avalon Hill had it, and that's it. I mean, where is it now? I did an interview with the designer of the game, uh, and he said that the rights are up. He, they're looking for a company. Maybe it's cursed, like the Bambino. The I Bambino don't know. Curse or something. I tried to get Days of Wonder to pick it up, but I don't think they're interested. Now I'm trying to talk Eagle into it. Somebody pick it up and make a beautiful game with expansions. The world loves Cosmic Encounter. Please reprint this game. Even Joe likes Cosmic Encounter, mm-hmm. even though he cheats at it. But Joe's not commenting right now because he's eating all the shrimp. All right. But that's my number one game, Cosmic Encounter. So those are our top ten games of things that games that we think should be reprinted. Yep. And by should be, we mean now. <laughs> so that's pretty much the uh, the end of our show. Uh, How do we do for time? Uh, I think we're actually a little shorter than normal by maybe five minutes or so. Well, let's just talk about something then. Well. What's your uh, favorite? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Next week, we're going to announce the winner of our contest, and we're going to introduce a new contest that has war games as the prize. Yeah, these are uh, war games that were... Uh, well, actually, we'll let you just drool on that for yeah, a while. So we're not going to give it away. That's about the extent of that. You'll hear about those next week. We have even more games coming up after that, and so look forward to our future shows. Please give us feedback. Tell us if there's audio problems. Tell us if you like the new uh, layout of our show. We, we modified it slightly for this episode, and... Um, what Tell else? us what you think. Joe will ignore it. I'll ignore it. But you, know, yeah, right. you never know. We might listen to it. <laughs> Actually, we we always listen to our feedback. No, I, we do, and we really appreciate that. We try to be fran- we try to be family friendly too. So uh, hopefully, we'll never say anything wrong. By the time do. you hear the show, you can go to thedicetower.com, dot com, and it will have a printed out list of our of our uh, top ten games with links on the internet where you can find out more information about them. So I guess that's it for today. Uh, I'm Tom Vassell. Are we done already? Well. Do we have anything else to say? <laughs> I don't know. No, I, I'm Joe Stedman. <laughs> <laughs> and thus we have another episode, episode 13. But this is an interesting episode just because of what we said here. We, we talked about games that we wanted to see re- reprinted. And in fact, in a couple episodes, I think it's episode 117, I'm not sure, we'll be talking about the best reprints. Sam and I will be discussing our favorite reprints, but if you look at the list of games in this episode that we said we wanted to see reprinted, my number one was Cosmic Encounter, and that is being done this year. That's you know that to me that's really exciting. My Fantasy Flight. I'm not even sure why in the show I said oh you know first I went to Days of Wonder then the Eagle Games, and I never took it to I never mentioned it to Fantasy Flight because I assumed that it would be at cross purposes with their uh, Twilight Imperium. So go just go show what I know. Uh, Trom Fabric, another game I want to see reprinted, was by Uber Play. Still waiting for Fortress America. Big City has promised to be reprinted by Valley Games. Uh, Hannibal Rome vs. Car- Carthage was reprinted this year. We the People is not being reprinted, but I believe a sequel for The People came out. Um, Atlantic Storm is having a sequel. Pacific Typhoon, which is coming out this year. Um, Kremlin, well... I'm still waiting on that one. La Cita, though, uh, or La Chita, I guess it's pronounced, that had a reprint a couple years ago. And so we're seeing a lot of these games actually being reprinted. It's 
we're, we live in an era of reprints. So that's that's pretty interesting. And so I, I, I like to go back and look at some of the lists we do sometime and to see how they've turned out. So top ten games we'd like to see reprinted. You know, if you ask me this list today, I might have a hard time with this because I'm really happy with the current crop of games. There's some games that are out of print, and I guess maybe because I have them, I don't think about them being reprinted so much, but it's a good time. There's 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 more games that are available than you could handle, really. I'm constantly getting rid of piles and piles of games because I can't play games all the time. None of us can play games all the time. I mean, and even if we were rich, independently wealthy, and had tens of thousands of games, you still wouldn't get them all played. You're going to have to make a decision somewhere. And so if a game is merely good, merely good, it doesn't deserve to be reprinted. However, Cosmic Encounter and some of the other games I mentioned, they are not merely good, but they are great. All right, well, this is Tom Vassal. I hope you enjoy listening to the show this week. We'll see you in just a bit with episode 116. Until then, I'll talk to you later. Thanks for joining us today. Stop by next week for episode 116, in which we talk about our top 10 next step games. We'd like to thank Your Move Games for their sponsorship. Check out www.yourmovegames.com to find out why Battleground Fantasy Warfare made Tom's top 10 games of all time, or join in the discussion on their forums. Until next week, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been listening to the Dice Tower. 